How did the kindergarten get to the United States? German immigrants brought it over the Atlantic to the U.S., but it wasn't the old stodgy white dudes who had brought the common school movement to life that were behind the kindergarten movement. Instead, it was a network of middle and upper class white women who enthusiastically embraced new education generally and the kindergarten specifically as an antidote to the rigidity of the common school movement as well as the issues of urbanization and immigration that were roiling the United States at the time. These women who were limited by a Victorian notion of a private female sphere were drawn to kindergartens in no small part because it gave them a public voice. As historian Ann Taylor Allen writes, women's opportunities for intellectual self-expression were very limited. Child rearing was one of the few subjects on which they could speak with authority. Kindergarten theory gave women reformers an impressive philosophical and scientific vocabulary with which to comment not only on child rearing, but on a host of related issues. One of the leading proselytizers of the kindergarten movement in the U.S. was Elizabeth Peabody of Boston, none other than Horace Mann's sister-in-law. She set up the first non-German kindergarten in Boston in 1860, and later traveled to Berlin to see the best in action. Her essay, Kindergarten Culture, was reprinted in the U.S. Commissioner of Education's Annual Report of 1870, and in it, Peabody warned that the country's prodigious energies are running so wild into gambling, trade, and politics, threatening us with evils yet unheard of in history. The nation's salvation might be found in Froebel's kindergarten. Quote, without taking the child out of his childish spontaneity and innocence, Froebel would make him a kind, intelligent, artistic, moral being, harmonizing the play of will, heart, and mind from the very beginning of life into a veritable image of the creativeness of God. Peabody got the word out, and soon women around the country found their vocation in kindergarten education. In contrast to the earlier infant schools, Peabody was explicit that these kindergartens should not merely be preparatory to the common school. She defined kindergartens, in fact, explicitly as schools for a company of children under seven years old who did not learn to read, write, and cipher. So what did they do then? They directed children's spontaneous and natural activity towards a more certainly beautiful effect than it can attain when left to itself. The object learning of Pestalozzi remained a key feature, with manuals instructing would-be kindergarten entrepreneurs in how to introduce these objects, typically called gifts in the jargon of kindergarten theory, and use them to teach all manner of knowledge. Class was oriented around tables rather than rigidly organized in unmovable benches, all facing forward, as in the common schools. The kindergarten in practice in Boston of the 1870s was typically for the wealthy, with tuition between $60 and $100 per year, which, trust me, was a lot back then. But enthusiasts argued that even rich kids needed to learn what was natural, since they were growing up in this strange new world of the city. Kindergartens, in their view, followed nature's plan for development. The literal gardening that was a key feature was required not because the kids were going to become farmers, but because of the importance of learning from Mother Nature. G. Stanley Hall, who was one of the pioneers of the emerging field of psychology and human development, studied Boston's first graders in 1880, on the dime of kindergarten supporters, by the way, and he found that 80% of children couldn't identify a beehive, 87% were dumbfounded by a pine tree, and 92% didn't even know what a triangle was. Kindergartners, however, did better than on his exams than did those without it. While Hall himself was critical of the restrictive nature of kindergartens in practice, his work defining childhood and the basics of development provided ammunition for the kindergarten reformers who sought to soften the rigid common school pedagogy. And the kindness of the teaching, in contrast to the harsh discipline of the common school, would help acclimatize the young to the American experiment in democratic capitalism. As one prominent reformer explained, kindergarten would teach trust and responsibility. Children must trust parents. We must all trust the tradesmen with whom we deal. Both the government and the economic system depended on it. All this could be hard to institute in practice, and the quality of kindergartens varied considerably, though Peabody and her allies worked to stamp out false kindergartens. While some kindergarten promoters were content with tuition schools, a lot of the fervor for kindergartens in the U.S. came from those who wanted to intervene in what would later be called a cycle of poverty. 
They sought to instill in the rough and tumble immigrant boys and girls, growing up often with little supervision in increasingly industrial environments. As one magazine declared, kindergarten was our earliest opportunity to catch the little Russian, the little Italian, the little German, Pole, Syrian, and the rest and begin to make good American citizens of them. A loose confederation of charity kindergartens sprung up, often funded through private philanthropy rather than tax dollars, and run by women's groups and settlement houses. A big feature of these charity kindergartens were frequent home visits by the teachers to observe the mother-child bond in action and nudge the parents to become better tutors for their young citizens. Kindergarten reformers made the case for a broader set of children's rights. In California, Kate Douglas Wiggin published a book by that name in 1894. It laid out the case for all children to the right to, quote, a place of his own, to things of his own, or surroundings which have some relation to his size, his desire, and his capabilities. In many respects, so far this story seems very similar to the common school movement, which made ubiquitous the public elementary school. We have a growing set of expensive private schools and a separate set of charity schools. Likewise, we have a set of reformers who were talking to each other, publishing in journals, petitioning state and city government to make these institutions universal. And yet it didn't happen in the case of the kindergarten. It wouldn't become universal until the 1980s, and by that point it had taken on a much more circumscribed definition as an additional grade for five to six-year-olds in preparation for the first grade. Why were they so different? We'll pick that up by looking at the St. Louis experiment in universal public kindergarten.